podcast listeners. If you hear my voice right now, I need you to do something for me. I want you to take out your phone or on your computer, go to Apple Podcasts, search for Ask Your Old Head Podcast. You'll see my, my logo, my little picture, my little image there. Find the show. Please rate and write a review. It's a small thing, but it helps others find this work and find what I'm doing here. And it really, really matters, uh, as small as that may seem. So if you could please do that uh, before we get into the show, I very much appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Let's get into it. Peace. Before we get into the podcast today, uh, I want to say thank you to you for listening and tuning in. Uh, this will be a Good Brothers episode, looking at The Devil You Know, a um, great book by a New York Times columnist, Charles M. Blow. Uh, I encourage you to, to pick the book up. Uh, this is definitely not in any way to be interpreted as us explaining you all of the salient points and, and concepts that he shares in the text. But hopefully, um, you know, a conversation that will be rewarding and, um, you know, enriching to 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 reading the text. And, um, well, I'll say that for later because we're going to get back, you know, into this. But um, as in all things, man, take the best part for yourself. Peace. Peace. I'm Majestic. My brother Justice, what's happening? Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, it's another glorious day in Zamunda. And, That's right. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh Getting together, I wanted to build with you today uh, on, I'm just get into it, uh, this here book, I'm going to put it on the, on the camera for a video that people may, may or may never not see, we'll see. Uh, the Devil, <laughs> you know, a uh, Black Manifesto by Charles M. Blow. Um, if you don't know Charles Blow, he's a uh, New York Times columnist, um, has had a lot of, you know, a lot of, I think, Insightful, these I think insightful pieces over the last couple of years. I think he's been a columnist since 2013, 2012, right around the early stages of the Black Lives Matter movement after the deaths of Trayvon Martin and um, and uh, I'm I'm not to mess up the brother's first name, uh, Brown in St. Louis, mm -hmm. and um, and uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I would say, for the least, it is a very uh, provocative um, and challenging vision, um, you know, and and I, I embrace and enjoy anything, especially in this time where, to a degree, the concept of sort of like the what could be perceived as academic idea, well, I would say the flow of academic ideas have, flown, have, have moved more toward this analysis of a circumstance, but not necessarily like action in the terms of like what he's advocating in this book in terms of the manifesto you know we've had um you know you got the works of like uh um what's my man um anti anti-blackness um, uh ibram kendi ibram kendi we got you know yeah. if you ever you know went and looked at like the black lives matter uh syllabus that was put together years ago around like racial analysis and and what have you which is like a big you know, body of different works that one would point someone to, to, to have a, a more, you know, to do like a study of, you know, different you know, areas around different issues impacting black people. Um, but I would say some of those kind, some of the, some of the works that I, I've experienced recently have been more what I would characterize as like almost academic and policy driven and not necessarily mm -hmm. like calling people to do something like for themselves, not like in opposition or in or in protest or something. You know what I mean? Which I think this is definitely not necessarily about going out to do like civic uh, direct action. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's definitely a, a piece that is, is centered on, you know, really like you know, where black people, what black people are gonna do, right? To 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 change their access to power um, in the states. But there are a lot of pieces in here and a lot, um, which I'm not we're not gonna be able to get into all of it because. Um, that would be for a different podcast <laughs> to, to walk you blow by blow through through the concepts of the book. Um, but in a broad sense, um, I guess maybe we could start here. You know, uh, oh, I guess I'll say 
So the the, the, the essential thesis, and you, you can watch a couple of interviews if you don't have read the book of uh, folks interviewing uh, Brother Blow, um, and you know is that for black people to achieve um, really the institutional power that they would need to improve their condition is uh, moving or working to migrate to uh, say seven southern states. Uh, let's see here if I can get that. Uh, uh, with the goal of uh, understanding the role that state power does actually hold in terms of many of the things and, and challenges that impact our community um, are actually impacted more at the state level than the federal level, federal level more for, I would say, for funding, <laughs> but the state level in terms of what the actual rules are um, is usually your state's, um, you know, politics and, and what have you, you know, guide, you know, sentencing laws, um, police, you know, the way police operate in total, you know, are a creature of your state. Um, the uh, tax, everything, tax and property law, um, you know, the, the racial covenants and things like that, um, you know, although they were empowered by uh, the redlining, like, and, and what were empowered by FHA, FHA rules and then the banks, but the actual function of it was in your, you know, within the rules of your state, right? So like, there's all these layers. Um, I find it, the, the states that he, he, he asserts uh, in a second, but yeah, so that's the central premise, you know, of the book is that um, the, the the fastest pathway or a pathway that might be best for Black people to really um, have lasting institutional power um, in this country would be to, in mass, start to, you know, appro approach some of these states and 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 make them home and. Uh, to the degree that you can tip the scales, and, and there is historical precedent in turn in this, but we can get to. So I, before I go on any longer, what's what's some of your what's your I guess first thought? You know, what I'm saying on the premise, or where would you like to to jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a it's an interesting take to your point. I think it's an intentionally provocative book, which, you know, I don't know if we've had many intentionally provocative books recently done by Black folks. That are tr that are sharing in the collective interest. So what I mean is, like tomes about how messed up white people are are not provocative. They're at this juncture, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like tell us something we don't know. And to your point, um, I think a lot of our conversations right now, how I would frame them, have been more about equity than power, right? Mm -hmm. So. Equity in the context of what we're talking about are what are broader systems that are supposed to serve us? How are they serving us or not serving us, right? Mm -hmm. This book is different because it brings back concepts around what are we going to do to assert and affirm our long-term existence, right? It, it, it's a shift. It's a shift that I think we grew so accustomed to hearing the conversations that the conversations of black power, I mean, and going back to, going back to, you know, Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, right? Mm -hmm. All those things of assertions and what is the role of black folks in their own power up into the civil rights and black power era, then over time have shifted and even the use of, I would argue, black power, black political power, black cultural power during um, the apartheid era, right? With Stevie Wonder, Gil Scott so famously, you know, pushing for that as well as pushing for the Martin Luther King holiday, right? Mm -hmm. So we get to a point where now, like to your point, a lot of our conversations are around social and structural things that harm black people and don't allow us to live. Um, like we we should be under the rights of this country, where he's asserting a different thing of like, hey, how about it's just not working for you up there? And you need to make a decision to go down here, right? Um, and what that kind of means, that's a shift. It's a shift of responsibility. 
Um, so for that reason, I think that's why this book is so important, regardless if you agree or don't agree. When you hear him talk about it, it's important to have the dialogue, even if you're saying, you know what, that's bullshit, cool. But at least we had the conversation. We didn't keep having the same conversations about things, unfortunately, that aren't working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or we would frame that we've seen very little change from the assertion of these things. I think if you put this in the context of the recent killings um, in Minnesota, as well as in Chicago, of black and brown boys and men and boys, you still get this context of there's all these places. And in both of those cities, you see this amazing thrust towards equity, right? You, you know, like Minneapolis um, is like top tier when it comes to talking about equity. Chicago, with, with all its challenges, has been pushing equity. But these real things of like these striking activities that cut to the core of our being are still happening in these cities. And I think that, you know, part of you read the book, part of his premise is if you want to look at where these police killings are happening, most of them are happening in the North and in the West, the North and Midwest and the West, yep. right? Yep. And when you start looking, it's hard to disagree, especially when you take out <laughs> the states of Florida and Texas, right. right? Which, you know, are like we've talked about in the Juneteenth uh, episode and talked about before, both Florida and Texas are like runaway states, Right. Yeah. They're states with like functionally different governments in America. Does anyone that's ever been to Florida or Texas <laughs> know that you feel like you're in a slightly different place when you're in both of those places? Absolutely. Right. No taxes in Florida. Like, you know what I mean? Um, you just build a house anywhere. It feels like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, there's just some, like different rules that these places play by. Um, and because of that and because of the salience and because of the resilience of white supremacy in both of those places, I concur and I think it's thoughtful of him to separate those states from where people should go. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I just think it brings it brings to bear a bigger conversation than we're having. Um, one of the ways I looked at it was like it's provocative at a place where we have to fight current battles, but we also need to have new conversations. Yeah. And even though this conversation isn't new, I mean, look at the NOI, look at the Republic of New Africa, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, in the context of Black folks, this isn't a new dialogue. And I, I'll, I'll touch a little bit about, I think, the history of the mentality of the RNA and kind of what it created in the South long term. But I just think that, like, while it's not new, it's new for many people whose mind states have been framed on the permanence of white racism and the role of white allies in that solution where what he's affirming is solely in the place of black folks in the, in the, in, mm -hmm. in our agency yeah and that is um i think one of the the, the one of two things I wanted to, to elevate early too, just in understanding the premise. So one, though, real quick. Uh, so the states, in particular, um, the uh, the nine is nine states. Um, that he's just Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. Which I know for some of you, you don't think of Maryland and Delaware as southern states. But and to are. you, and, and to you, <laughs> I say to everyone who does not see them in even Delaware, I understand because of the Philadelphia metropolitan area, go to Dover, Delaware, go anywhere south of Wilmington <laughs> by the river, and you will know about the history of black folks and white folks down there, the crab men and stuff like that. That mm -hmm. in some ways, Dover, Delaware, Delaware is as south as it gets. Go by Sorry. Dell State. Um, so no, I, I concur. Yeah, yeah but you know, I, I know how people do. They go, nah, we talking about you know down south. I'm like, Maryland's the south, <laughs> the, the border. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> and also, um, uh, also suggesting that gravitating to the major cities. Um, and I'll, I'll read actually. I, I suggest gravitating to the major cities arranged like jewels on a chain, which dot the interstate twenty. 
uh, Interstate 95 corridor from Shreveport, Louisiana to Wilmington, Delaware. They include Jackson, Mississippi, Birmingham, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, Columbia, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, um, which is a little bit north of I-20, Richmond, Virginia, yeah. Washington, D.C., and the Maryland suburbs. Um, you know, they're all right in there in Baltimore. Uh, and and then, you know, the, the whole reality that Washington, D.C. is not a state, but understanding that if that it is a a, a district, um, you know, one is, is has a has a historic long large you know black community and had you know at different times, um, you know it was Chocolate City for a reason, um, or referred to as such. Um, and so so there's a couple things I think I wanted to also elevate with that though is, uh, the importance of actual like. There's multiple. There's mo- there's a multi multidisciplinary aspect happening here in terms of talking about location and place where people are. You know, geography and 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 and, and actual measure, like not theoretical measure. Like we always been in this city. You've been in this city since 1952. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, and sometimes in our you know in in these different fights and battles that we got going on, um, we don't always track the timing. Mm-hmm. And the, like the, the 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 ebb and flow and the and the continuity arc of, of where black people have been and where they are at. Um, you know, I mean, where um, you know, where we moved from, where where you know, why, what what for? I mean, you know, the, there's lots of there's a good stuff out there now that can help people that don't understand how the migration happened and what was in, in, in involved in it. But I think as you go through the text, he does try to ground the, the concepts and the arguments in actual data, not not just in, like, I think this is a good idea, but in that, like, yeah, like, right after the Civil War, I mean, even after Reconstruction, I mean, like, Black people didn't leave in mass from the South until, you know, until, um, you know, World War One, you know, and World War Two, And and then also the bull, the bull weevil, you know, devastation of the cotton industry. Like, these things, like even our working class or middle class, you know, however one construes that, because we know middle class being black ain't the same as middle class being not black. Um, but you know, from a, from a class class conscious brothers and sisters out there, you know, what I'm saying I, I'm aware. Um, and 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 I think he pointed out earlier that like early in in the migration, there was an often uh, unattached young men, you know, what I'm saying, and often men that maybe didn't have access to, you know, op- as much oppor- any opportunities that left. You know, and, and and then also people, you know, Ford, other industry, other, you know, Ford being one of the, the bigger ones. Um, uh, that's some other in, in the early phases, um actively recruiting <laughs> black people and black men to come work in these factories, um, you know, not always with uh the most, you know, egalitarian or, or respectful uh reasons, sometimes often to suppress the wages of, you know, who they had around. Um but also it, it still, you know, in many ways offered, you know, financial opportunities that um, you, you know, one couldn't access in the South, depending on how you were situated. Because uh, the, with, even with the lynching and the violence that um, was a prominent feature of the South, you know, there was a, there were, there was, there was a class structure and it still is class structure, I guess I just say it was that existed and some people within the confines of the experience were doing well enough versus you know even though you still had many you know more people who maybe we we would consider you know uh impoverished now there were other you know structural factors of society that were different you know if you go back to 1900 to the 1950s where you might have people living on you know shared family land and having the ability to so basically maybe live off the land a little bit so you mm-hmm. you could balance out your like where now most people if you're not working you don't have no you don't have the basics that you need <laughs> like you know what I mean like you especially if you've moved you know where our cities have gone and, and things of that nature but that's for another conversation I just wanted to, to lay out that like you know he, he really does look at that like what were some of the factors that got people moving um, and then are the things that we think of what is happening with people in cities, um, especially a lot of the cities that we inhabit and, and where we have, you know, you know, for whatever degree, the racial 
event that we've experienced the last year. I, I still I'm with you and that I don't 100% know if it's a racial wrecking, reckoning, <laughs> but yeah. Um, but the idea that like, you know, the of the top 10 places where black people live in concentrated property, they're all cities in the North and the West. Um, you know, the shootings, the, um, that in many ways, the, although initially before, you know, before whiteness galvanized around the idea uh, in some of these cities that you needed to limit or isolate um, these black people, uh, you know, cities really instituted practices that were very Jim Crow like, if not, you know, Jim Crow in name, in terms, you know, you know. We, I mean, listen, if you, if, for people, when you think about Boston, when you think about Philadelphia under Rizzo, when you think about Baltimore, even with a succession of black leaders, and Baltimore is kind of like the one kind of weird, mm -hmm. weird city here, right? Yeah. It, it's, um, and I think that's because of the economic control, but I wanted, I want to touch on those later. But when you think about these Chicago, when you think about all these places that obviously culturally, New York City culturally are very important for Black people. If you think about the broader sojourn of people's success, the broader sojourn of the Black community in these places, to your point, except if you're talking about, to some degree, Boston, Philadelphia, parts of New York, you're talking about a new event. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I mean, the Philadelphia Negro is unique in its, by W. By the boys is unique in the fact that it talks about black folks a hundred years ago in a in a major northeastern right. city, right? Right, like it wasn't like it was a whole bunch of black folks everywhere, and that's but the particular history of the Quakers and Philadelphia, and going back to Octavius Cato and his relationship with Frederick Douglass. I mean, that's a that's a particular form of history, but the broader sense of like black folks being in all these cities for all this time. To your point, it's a it's a 50, 60 year old event. But you know, in our black in the community, often what's happening is happening now, right? Right. right. <laughs> so it's like our memory, because our collective knowledge of ourselves becomes very limited to northeastern, midwestern, and western cities. And that's also, I think, because of some of the cultural movements, that our frameworks of where we have been have become structured by that. Um, we, you know. Uh, Oh, up until recently, you don't really get a lot of, you don't learn a lot about the time between 1840 and 1900 for black people, mm -hmm. right? Like that's just part of history that's not taught. So we don't talk about where we were. Right. So, right. so I just think that's a, again, that's this question of, are we being successful here? And a unique part of that, and that I think is worth bringing up is this. There's some research done by uh, Dr. Andrew Perry um, now at American University. Previously, he was with Brookings. Um, there are 1,200 majority Black towns in America, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only four of them are west of Texas. Mm -hmm. Four. Yep. Right? The, the vast majority of these majority Black places are in the Southeast. They range from Newark, New Jersey, you know what I mean? Down to, and down into the southeast. So it is a very real reality that from a if you were looking at things from a where are we currently situated to build power from a city building perspective, what he I mean, he makes a extremely kind of good point that is backed by data. And the second point I want to make about that is it's not only backed by data in that sense, it's also backed by data in the sense that if you're from the Northeast in the Midwest, you've seen a reverse migration based on interest for the last 25 years. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Like we've seen everybody got a family member that moved to Atlanta. Everybody got a family member that's doing better in North Carolina now. Everybody got a family member who moved to the D.C. suburbs, right? And don't see nothing but black folks all day and yeah. now brown folks, right? Mm -hmm. So what he's talking about is decisions people have been individually making for some time. 
Now, if they've been individually making them because they're thinking about group loyalty is a point I want to bring up. Hmm. What he's talking about is actually making a decision from a position of group loyalty, not individual interest. And that's where I find all these conversations get complicated. Yeah. Because he's not, he, if you look at young people and look at Atlanta and look at now Houston, even though Texas is a <laughs> you know outlaw state. <laughs> but if you if you look at Houston, I mean you look at the, these places, you look at, you know, to some degree Miami, you look at just some, you know, what we talk Charlotte. These are places that folks are making the decision to go anyway. Right? Because they see black people being successful in a way that in many parts of the Rust Belt, they don't see people look like them being as successful. There's data that shows that for black folks who have college educated, college educated black folks, it is often easier for the also for the reasons that some black folks don't want to move to the South, which is frankly for corporate positions in more open business states, it's one thing. So a black person with a degree finds it easier to go be successful in many of these places. So I, so it's, a, it's an interesting thing. What he's talking about, we've already been, I would argue, doing. When you see what happened with Stacey Abrams, when you see what happened with the um, the flipping of Georgia, um, we see that this has already been an occurrence. Yeah. But the question is, do people start having a conversation by making a collective decision to do these kind of things, right? Mm-hmm. Or is it, in, is it a continual example of individual decision making for how people find themselves in places? Yeah, and that's what I think is um, is it, it, is striking about the ask and 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 the push is, and and it's it's to me it's a question that lies at the that lies in the root of some of the like the things that people sort of take off the table as an option to, to put yourself in a position that you think works, that works better for you. Right now I've experienced, um, even living here in Portland lines, people that are in a, and when we, you know, we lived, I lived in Pittsburgh. I mean, like where people were like, yeah, I'm going, um, I'm moving to Texas. I'm moving to Atlanta. I mean, I'm with a great deal of people that went to college of those that did that went to college in in either Atlanta, uh, North Carolina, or Virginia, uh, some of them came back. Um, a, a good, I'd say, a, hel- a healthy number came as far back as Maryland <laughs> and stopped. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they didn't come all the way back to New Jersey, but they got that. You know, they got to Maryland and said, "I'm gonna say I'm gonna be in this DC area." Um, and you know, and it's something I think that becomes this sort of like. <laughs> I know touchy might not be the right word, but I'm gonna go with it. Touchy conversation about choice, um, mobility, um, and you know, and and his premise is not just you know, like he, he has one premise part of the premise leads to some of the interviews and some of the the part for much you know my first reads of the book um, are about you know middle like middle class opportunity or that that currently in many of these say, these these spaces. If you are middle class, you're probably doing better there than you are in some of these northern cities or your experience, your quality of life may actually be better um, for whatever number of factors. Um, and but also that the 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 working class jobs that we sometimes at least we will assert as sort of the the panacea to improve the conditions of people. Um, are not in these northern cities. If if it's the auto industry, there's more factories been built in southern states uh, than in the north in, in, over the last 20, 30 years. Um, you know, now I would, you know, add, and I don't think he shies away from that part of that is the intentional idea of trying to get away from the labor power. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. Power and, I was, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and cutting sweet deals with these different towns and, and, and municipalities. Um, 
you know, and also though, but it's something too to think about that, and, and you brought up with that that pre clean with the twelve hundred different um, majority black towns and municipalities, cities. It's like, you know, I've been like living here um, in Portland, and uh, I remember interacting with a staff member who was like, "Yeah, I just want to go to a town that's like all black." And this is, and I was thinking like, "Oh, I know some." I was like, "I grew up in all black. <laughs> I grew up in, at least as I experienced it in all black town in New Jersey." Like. I mean, they, 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 we got all black towns jumping out <laughs> shoes and socks. Like that's, you know, I didn't think about it as such a, a precious thing growing yeah. up in it, like, but going somewhere where people have like, they've never experienced being in a classroom where it was 18 black kids, two white kids, uh, and an Asian brother. Like, they they like, I don't, I don't know nothing about that. Like, where where, where did you live? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, and and there's, something, there's something, there's something seductive there's something seductive about it, but then you, again, you have to then manage the, the, what is the role of power in that being seductive, mm -hmm. meaning where was that at in the cycle of life, right? Like, okay, just not, not Willingboro, because I think Willingboro, again, is unique in the country when it comes to these like black suburbs that, or suburbs that became black, <laughs> yeah. right? Suburbs that quickly became black and have been maintained as black that's not on the first ring of a, a plurality or majority black city. Mm -hmm. And I think Willingboro is unique in that, right? Like Camden and Trenton are both, they're not like big towns, right? So it's not like you can account for it by Philly. Philadelphia doesn't make you account for Willingboro. Right. Um, there's something seductive in seeing that, but then there's also how much power, which I think cuts to his conversation. Is this going to be majority black and then all the lights are going to get cut off here or we're not going to get the same services? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How much control do you have over that city? Which is, I want to submit here something that, again, is part of this concept we have to wrestle with. Because if we look at Atlanta and look at all that Atlanta means, Atlanta continuously has to fight with the state about control of the airport, right? We know that that municipal institution is a huge institution from which a lot of black wealth flows in black jobs and black wealth flows in Atlanta. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the control of the airport is something that's constantly being fought for to maintain. Right. Um, again, from a power conversation. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And with, you know, what I'm saying. Uh, its current mayor, uh, you know, uh, Mayor Lumumba, being this black city, black co black college history, but also getting almost no support from the state when it came to having a water emergency for a month mm -hmm. post the weather emergency they had in 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 in, uh, in the south, right? So there's these like infrastructure conversations, which cuts to this place of like, okay, we are here flourishing in this place, but do we control the means of predicting the future of the place? So it's seductive two ways. Because I'm arguing the North, it often feels like with black mayors and stuff like that, you know, folks control the future of those cities, even though that's actually proven not to be the case as we see with a lot of capital and neighborhood change has happened in many big cities in the Midwest and in the North and in the West, right? Mm -hmm. Oakland, California is a good example. Chicago is a great example. Philadelphia is a great example of these places where it's like black folks, as, as John Street famously said, the brothers and sisters are running the city. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But when you look at the capital that comes into a city and, and how easily it can displace deeply poor people, on the flip side, in the South, it's like, okay, well, look at these places. It's all people who look like us. But do you control the means of operation in those places? Which is, again, I think him cutting to like, hey, you need to go back. You need to go to these places and get control of the state, which is different. Yeah, you just need yeah. to move to yeah, these to the cities. City. Yeah, and that's right? what I think was the uh, thing I, I wanted to elevate because I, I think within within the context, it, it's not just saying, yeah, like just move to Atlanta. It's saying every the environs that is the that whole state that to, to look at having enough you know and, and this is with 
the thought, which I think is, is still pretty good, that, that we historically black people do, even if we differ actually in our, our political values, we tend to end up voting in our common interest for the most part. I think we, as we talked about earlier, you know, 20% of black men disagree with everything, but a lot of that, half that 20% right. is still going to vote. <laughs> they still ain't going to vote for, for your mans that, you know, the orange dude, or, you know what I'm saying? Until like, a, you know, there's still a significant portion of that's going to be like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm conservative. Doo, 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 doo. Yeah. I'm not voting for that guy. <laughs> right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like right. it, we have a different way we show up and, but I, and I think that the at least for me the thing that's curious is is to think about one state power and that is so if you're talking about you know advocating people moving back to these um, these states you know and and I would think that there a lens depending on how your family you know, may have migrated and what the connections are you know there's probably a lens or a overlay to apply to this to say well what are some of the, the places where your folks moved from. And do you still have family there that if you moved back, you, you would actually have some people you're you, either you're connected to or or could connect to to kind of like reestablish your roots. Right. Um, or think about like, yeah, actually, my, you know, I mean, at least I'll, I'll take you through my own thought exercise on some of these things. Um, you know, I think about Garner, North Carolina, you know, where my grandfather uh, father and mother, you know, came from in that area in the Riley Durham, you know what I'm saying, uh, area. And that, at least on the stuff that I could find, you know, I know my great grandfather, they had, had owned a piece of land or something. I think his brother had a piece of land. I think his mother, you know, relatives, you know, had a farm or something there. And, you know, it's part of me goes like, well, maybe that's somewhere to target if I was like, yo, I really want to buy some land and, you know, have to do, do, do the farming thing or something, right? Like these are, places where you actually have some roots, you know, at least in, in, in the context of that, that's where your folks is from. Um, you know, the other parts of my family is along the Maryland border and in, in West Virginia and Virginia. So, you know, it's like seven or eight different areas in terms of places that would be more rural. We're going to be like, should we be thinking about, you know, re reoccupying these spaces, right? Like how does that change the, 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 the the social and political landscape of those areas. And then and, and when I think about also improving the quality of life conditions of black people, you know, I'm 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 a strong advocate of the idea that, you know, some spaces for some people may just always be untenable situations that are only going to get but so good. And the idea of like, yo, you know what you might need to think about? You might need to think getting the fuck out of here. I know you don't really want to think about that. You don't like I don't really want to move to, you know, a farm a rural, a small town outside Shreveport, but you might need to think about it because, you know, you know, especially sometimes when young is, you know, involved in, you know, in the street life and various other things, it's like, I don't see a pathway where playing by these rules that you may get to the place that you want to be also with the reality that you can get enough space between whatever you were past involved in that you won't accidentally run into a situation where somebody come home and they still mad at you about what happened back in in 2003 and, and you know, take a shot at you. And you you know, moved on, you trying to like be a different person and take care of your family and you're rebuilding your life. And this dude, he like, I'm still in 2003. Right. I'm still mad at you, <laughs> right? Like, it ain't the answer for everybody, but for some people it's like, yo, man, you might need to really think about like, maybe this city, like maybe this ain't, ain't worth the energy to try to stay here just because you've been here. Um, and, and I think that there's a, there's a, a tension around place and space. I mean, obviously, I guess we've talked about, you know, gentrification and other things where, you know, we, you know, we get a bit of the like, even if it ain't the best place to keep, we want to keep it because we, because we got it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And don't want to seed it, so to speak to these other people, but there's, there's, there's a, you know, I like the idea of people going, you know what? I mean, you know, well, I put it like this, my, um, my, my grandfather didn't want to leave train. He was like, I'm, I'm cool. I'm here. I ain't trying to go. Um, and, and I respect that. You know what I mean? Build a world, build a life. He wasn't trying to go back nowhere else. Um, uh, he didn't want to visit. Um, later, later in his life. 
But I mean, most of my family, I mean, most of my family is not all basically still in Trenton. Like we're in and around. I mean, I'm obviously a few thousand miles away. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I like to keep Oregon on his toes and say, you ain't got me forever, I might leave. You know what I'm saying? Just, and just, then they get then they get paranoid. Okay, go ahead. Right, they get a little tense, right? You know what I'm saying? But you know, I'm ready. I I'm I, I like to keep the I I think that there's a there's a a certain pressure you can exert on circumstances by being like, you know, I could also just not be here. I could bounce. And, and and giving yourself the space to think like these aren't the best places for us. But then, you know, what where, where would you go? What would you do when you got there? You know, is the, the part that I think that that really needs some I, I would like to see people think about. You know what I mean? Because I think some people, you know, especially when um as you've you I mean, we've both seen it, somebody goes, yo, man, I went to Atlanta, man. Oh man. It was like black people, oh man, it was like, oh man. Like they come back like, you know, super, super hype, like what they saw. But like how it's working, <laughs> they don't really know. Right. And that's the agency, right? Because it, it's like they see it again. There's been, I would argue, in some ways, you could say almost close to a hundred years of being purposeful of black folks in Atlanta, right? Mm-hmm. Going back to Booker T. Washington, <laughs> right? In a very specific methodology of then post in the civil rights and black power movement, how Atlantans decided to engage with corporate America, corporate Atlanta, mm-hmm. right? So I, it goes back to like, at some point, there was, an, there was a determined idea to play these things out. Which to your point, where you see a lot of people go to Atlanta, if, you, if you're not set up, just popping up in Atlanta ain't always the best because- yeah. It's a whole bunch of people from Atlanta who's still struggling to get what you got. Right. Right. And black and black people moving from all over the South to Atlanta. Right. Not just the East, not just the North. Right. Black folks mm-hmm. from Jackson, black folks from Alabama, they moving into Atlanta for opportunity. So yeah. unless you got these opportunities going, you're fighting with a whole bunch of people trying to win, which, which I see a lot of what I had tendency is I see a lot of Pittsburgh, particularly a lot of people come back to Pittsburgh if they're not really, if they weren't set up to be successful in Atlanta. Because mm-hmm. I would, you know what I mean? So it's, a, it's an agency conversation, right? It's a, okay, if we go to these places, are we going as participants or at some point are we going as collective predictors of our history, right? Are we going as people who are thinking about our collective future. And that's why I think, like I said earlier, he brings up this very salient point that at what point are you an active participant in the success of your collective community? Now, for a long time, we have framed that. What that means is to give back socially, right? So if you think about what does it mean Mm -hmm. to like care about your community? Well, it means that you coach a team. It means that you come out for a community meeting. It means you give white folks or black folks downtown the business. Like that's what it has meant to care about your community. In the South, I think that takes on a different identity. Mm. In the South, that takes on the identity of what is, because people are already supporting other black people. They're already supporting their businesses. What does it mean to now vote for people? What does it mean to give to state elections to ensure that your governor is a black person. What does it mean to make sure your state representatives, you know, that not only you put your representatives in, that you also participate in keeping people out who you don't want, which is another, again, another form of agency. Hmm. Because it's one thing in the South to say, okay, I moved down here, I spent my money down here, I bought a house, I raised my kids. It's another thing to say, not only did I vote for the black person that's my state senator, but I also gave money so that you could keep a state senator in another part of Georgia out. Right, right. Right? That's, a, that's another part of keeping and maintaining and developing power, which is not always part of this conversation. But, but it would have to be going, thinking yeah, about this. it had to be. I mean, because to me, and I think this might be a good good spot to for you, you could give people a quick on the Republic of New Africa, and then, then I can add on. 
Um, because because I think you really have to start if, if for this to be a like a, a operational ethos, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Say so because and this is also a longitudinal activity. This is not a everybody move there in the next two years. This is a over the next 20 to 30 years, this curve, you know, this this sort of decision making, um, um, especially for those that are able and for those whom it would be advantageous. Um, but I, and I and I definitely I think within the context of, of his own vision, it's like he's he's really talking more to younger people who would not have as much to uproot. You know what I'm saying? To 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 build a life, start building a life. You know, in in some of these states, you know what I mean, where some of us it might be, you know, oh, damn, I gotta sell a house. I mean, it was really, I have to get another job that's maybe equivalent to the job that I've established here. <laughs> Right, depending on what work you do, you you know maybe like the relationships and networks and everything else involved with the work that you do. Um, moving to a whole other state to do the same thing may or may not be easy, but um, but I think the the, 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 the touching on the Republic of New Africa, and then and then to me because uh, because of the thoughts I have in terms of like, you know, how do you start to lay out a way to operationalize this or to to to, to bring this idea into to your like larger thinking is, you know, what what is the, you know, do you have a, a model for food security? You know what I mean? Like uh, are you advocating um, you know, power generation, um, trade and commerce, you know, meaning like, you know, port the the ports and you know and 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 and, and infrastructure systems like to to get the things that you need and not be suddenly hamstrung because you know, like I said, everybody moved to the wrong city <laughs> and, and, and those who would not want to see you in power have find an easy enough way to sort of cut you out of, of access to things or opportunities. Um, but I think, I think that the, in terms of the, the, the idea of, 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 the, of, of intentional movement amongst black people, I, I don't think is always like it, it's elevated now more with, you know, actually people willing to talk about the, the, the great migration as an intentional willful act of black people trying to operate in their own self-interest and not necessarily as a sort of like will be gone uh experience you know what I mean? because I, we, that's the way i felt like as a kid it was just sort of like oh and then black people moved to the north and it's like i mean like but why like there was no context it was just like oh black people moved to the north you know what i mean it with also leaving out that there was black communities that had been in other parts of the, the country you know since the country was a country. Um, so, though, you know, could you real quick touch on, like, the Republic of New Africa, like what it was? I, I mean, I, I have something that I'd like to hear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for, for folks in the, the short version of the Republic of New Africa, and again, to put this in the context of, you know, um, a variety of conversations about what is the best way for Black people to survive and flourish in America. So you had everything from, you know, People saying the best way to do it is to partner with our allies and and get the results in the civil rights we deserve as citizens, all the way to the Nation of Islam calling for a separate black nation in the South, and all the way to the RNA, Republic of New Africa, who you know was a uh, revolutionary nationalist movement, also calling for a plebiscite in the South. Because to them, that's where all the black people were. And even still saying that's where the black people, well, two things, that's where the black people were and that's where the land was. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. the term free the land, um, which was a really well used term during the, during the 60s, 70s, and, and some families still, you know, my mother said free the land, mm-hmm. so she left here. But like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> but like, you know, there's this idea. And when you look at the history of the RNA, particularly Republic of New Africa, there were armed clashes with Mississippi police and Mississippi state troopers over land because they yeah. actually went back to the South and said, we are building a public site, we're building a community, right? Um, and there were varying examples of black folks going back to the South, Soul City is an example of one in North Carolina. Um, mm-hmm. This is another example. Soul City was trying to be built with government help. This was clearly trying to be built without government help. Mm-hmm. One of the main people who were the one of the leaders of R- RNA was Chokwe Lumumba. Chokwe Lumumba was uh, born in Detroit. He was a lawyer in Detroit. He moved his family. Um, he was back and forth between Mississippi and Detroit. 
for many years, was also known as the lawyer who represented Tupac in many of his cases and represented many of the um, uh, political prisoners um, that we that we talk about. And so eventually they made a decision to move down to Jackson, Mississippi and to take roots in, in, the, in, the, in the town. Over time, they became trusted, known supporters of the community to the point where Chokwe Lumumba, being someone known as a member of the RNA, never renouncing it, never doing anything, becomes the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. He dies eight months later in a tragic, you know, just tragic uh, occurrence of him, a uh, health-related death. Um, but he ran on a strategy of making Jackson fair for all residents to the point where he ended up getting the business support of Jackson because they recognized him as a fair arbiter of what needed to happen, but also bringing solidarity and freedom to residents by fairness. His father, Chokwe uh, Lumumba, uh, dies. There's a, a mayor that comes in. His son, Antar Lumumba, Chokwe Antar Lumumba, runs, he loses. And then recently, he just won his second term in Jackson. So it's a really interesting example of taking the principles of self-determination and then taking them to a place, locating yourself in that place, again, for power, then eventually trying to use the means of the systems of government to advance those interests, right? Now, again, this doesn't happen easily. My example of the weather emergency and the water emergency for a month underscores the deep infrastructure challenges that many of our Black cities face in the South. Um, because of lack of investment by the state government. So when you look at the RNA, look at this history of moving to the South, taking up roots in cities. Um, you could look at uh, Jamil Alamine and him going to the South, you know, post everything, you know, people known as Rat Brown, going to the South mm -hmm. in Atlanta, going to the West End, cleaning up the neighborhoods. So there's a lot of these reverse migration examples that are already present yeah. that we don't have to talk, you know, now, what I want to do is juxtapose a part of the history that we don't know, which is the whole thing about Vermont and mm -hmm. the, 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 the clear decision made by a number of progressives and what they would, what they would have been called hippies at that time to move to Vermont to take a state that was not progressive, that was filled with a whole bunch of gun-toting Second <laughs> Amendment uh, just left Canada, <laughs> folks, right? And, right? and then within a couple generations turned Vermont into a place that elects Bernie Sanders and Patrick Leahy, right? right? It turns it into this like eco-socialist <laughs> utopia, right? And so I, I, I use that for an example of that's never talked about how there was a, a thrust of a migration to serve personal collective and political ends. And so yeah. this dialogue, that's why I mean just to reinforce what you've already talked about, this dialogue is so important because it's not new and it's relevant. And at least it has to be part of a conversation to look at the future of how black folks are going to function. Well and, and I think the Vermont example um as as a, as a living uh thing to point to is also though is that the people had common political ideas. Right, because right. I think within that, and, and and it begs to me the question or the thought or the challenge, even in, in in this being, like I said, a longitudinal vision. Concurrent with that is because because right now I think like we have again we have I think certain common interests when it gets down to making a decision that Black people vote on and go yeah I'm a vote like if voting is a, as a test of who we'll vote for, but I. I and I think it's a significant part, actually, when you, when you talk about Jackson, um, you know, like the, like, like the Jackson Rising, you know, which talks about the work of building, um, you know, basically building assembly vehicles to get the ideas of Black people <laughs> and, 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 and other people who may be aligned and turn those into policy action <laughs> and, 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 and how you want to run things, right? Because I think 
if there, there's there's a net effect if just black people, however they see the world, do just by number move to some to let's say um let's say even like state like Delaware, right? Which I think for some people would maybe be a more accessible, like depending on how you situated. Like I'll, I'll say it like this: if for someone that grew up in New Jersey and in in, in the in the you know Wilmington is in the greater Philadelphia area, so you could move to Wil- Wilmington and not really feel like you left. <laughs> You know, right, outside of whatever right. it feels like to live in Wilmington, it feels like to live in Wilmington day to day, because because I because I am very conscious of people's people's day to day habit like kind of ha- habit habitual sensibilities make a lot of their decisions, right? So you have people who, like something that challenges sometimes Black folks when they come here for the first time, and people from Portland get totally pissed off about it when people come here from somewhere else and they start going, I can't find this kind of black food product. I can't find that, can't find this. And then black people from here always go, who the fuck did you ask? Did you ask anybody? Or did you just go off into some damn store in, you know, whatever, you know, part of uh, in a, in a sur- surrounding ring suburb, which is most likely where people tend to move because it's actually more affordable. And if you moved here for a company job, that company, unless it's in downtown Portland, is probably either west of the city, um, here where I live, Washington County, or east of the city, or maybe southeast of the city. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like these, you know, these logistical factors, but right. And and then people's expectation of what it like, like, you know, I, I didn't add this shock, but I guess, you know, some people do where they're like, damn, I suddenly didn't see a lot of black people. <laughs> it kind of freaked me out, right? Like these sensibility pieces become a lot of where people are going to be comfortable mo- locating. I think the other side of that is some people who have, have grown up more in conditions where there's not a lot of black people are not always comfortable around a, suddenly a lot of black people, even though they themselves are black. And, and we, we have to talk about that in maybe, maybe a future conversation. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, I, I think uh, if you... <laughs> I, I think about it like this. If you were in, say, New York, and somebody, like, there's certain places in the country where there's already enough, like, New York-like people, even though it ain't New York, that you would move there and you'd feel okay. You'd A.K.A. Feel okay. Atlanta. <laughs> A.K.A. Atlanta. <laughs> That's right. why everybody moved to you Atlanta, because they felt like their cousin, their best friend, the person who went to school with them, they got a right. club. They, there, they, yeah. got, they got chicken wings. They, <laughs> they got a chicken wing store or something crazy. Like, no, I mean... That's why I think Atlanta particularly starts to inhabit this broader kind of like space of everything for everybody because of the amount of people, but also because of the infrastructure that Atlanta has that pertains to Black people. One, highways, transportation, and then two, also places of higher education, Mm -hmm. right? So they're always producing just from the HBCUs that are there and from the state schools that are around there, they're producing thousands of graduates, black graduates every year. So they're also, they're always producing as many graduates as people that may come out of school in that area. So it's always going to inhabit this kind of place. But I do think your, your point about sensibilities and your point about for some people, the suburbs of Maryland are an appropriate place to see this goal. Mm-hmm. For some people, yeah, yeah. Richmond is an appropriate place. For some people, Durham, North Carolina, or Charlotte is an appropriate place. For some people, it's Birmingham, right? So again, when you're thinking about this group dynamic, it's about what makes sense for everybody to then advance a collective goal. Whereas, it's interesting, I just thought about this when you said this, our current fight for black lives, if you will. If you look at a lot of people who are leading these movements, and I can only speak for what I've seen here, but also a lot of places, a lot of times there's not a lot of deep organizing in the black communities most impacted by police violence. You Mm -hmm. see a lot of multiracial allies and a lot of different folks who are coming together to protest what is rightly so a stripping of basic rights of citizenship. But it's not necessarily that everybody's running to organize in Homewood or so everyone's running to organize in these, in these certain neighborhoods. So to your point, I think there's something to be said for even this current incarnation of what it means to fight for Black people 
that it is yeah. it, it ain't always it's it's always black people I think centered for a good reason, but it's not always all black people fighting for it. Where yeah. black people yeah, making their own decisions on where they go. Yeah, and 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 to to touch back to the the one thing that did come up and in is like you know the 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 Vermont commune conversation, right? When we were all oh, the hippies and living the commune. But part of that was so these people who didn't necessarily have a plan on how they were going to have economic stability. That's like you had to kind of figure out some other way to live so you could take care of yourself, right? And 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 with something like this, and even with some of this, and this is I would say touching on the add on to your point around. Like I said, I think there's a lot of black people that are a lot. There's a lot of activity organizing around black political action, but not actually organizing black people. <laughs> right? Not actually exactly. going like, yo, we're having we're having purposeful meetings around how we're going to operate, how we want to convert the way this neighborhood operates. Like us, like whoever's coming. Well, who's at the meeting? Everybody that came to the meeting at the meeting. We should get more people to the meeting. Like, and then like. Like like that that ethos of organizing where it's like, you know, what we what we give praise to the Black Panther Party for doing, um, in terms of the internal services aspect. I don't find people having the the stomach um or the will. Or I, I don't, you know, I'm I'm still trying to touch it. I'm still trying to understand it. Like where it's like, no, I look, I, I I accept at some point if this is gonna change wholesale, like I, I need to actually go get black people. <laughs> like they need to be interested in, and involved in this. Like you I can't I can't just try to change the conditions and around them as they operate. I can't just try to change the rules the police play by or the way the prop like it's like, oh, we're gonna change, you know, we're gonna change the way how you can evict somebody or you can't evict somebody. We're gonna change how you like all this, like, but none of it, but but very People are very, maybe in a better way I say it, I feel like there's a, there's a prescribed lane of things that people feel it's okay to like go and engage with people about them that may get into how they actually live, right? Um, and often that is sort of restrained to like the world of relationship decisions. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? From, you know, wherever you land on that, whether you think people should be super open or should be, you know, very what we might call traditionally conservative, whatever, like right. we feel pretty comfortable letting somebody have some sort of, you know, I mean, from the, uh, the Kevin Samuels of the world to the, uh, what's, I'm, I'm trying to think the, 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 what would be the, the opposite pole. I don't know who the opposite pole Derek is. Derek Jackson? Um, oh. Derek Jackson, Derek Jackson. <laughs> um, like you know, I remember the uh, brother was like, "If you want to be famous on, the, you want you want to grow up on social media, you do fitness, relationships, or finance. <laughs> like those are the topics that you can talk about, yeah. and you grow a following of people wanting to hear what you have to say. But even within that, it's not. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you got to be financial. You know, brother, we got to get this. We got to build this. Get this wealth generation going, right? But we're gonna have a conversation about wealth generation. Like we we feel comfortable being almost." at least some level of judgmental in a public space or having a conversation that could be construed that way or calling people to me, oh, no, we're going to teach the brothers how to, how to invest in the stock market or, you know, whatever. But if we have a conversation like, listen, I know you grew up, you know, on 12th Street. Your mom and them, they was over on, on the west side. You know, and this is, a, this is, these are not actual places. These are just as analogs that there's a west side or a 12th street. or This, this, this is black, black, right. black language, right? The west side, 12th yeah, street, down whatever. the bottom, up the top, up the, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> whatever the ML, off MLK. Yeah, across the tracks, MLK, for MLK, right. Yeah, wherever you are at and go, all right, look, man, what do we want to be the operating rules of these four, this 10 block square block radius? All other things, meaning from the type of housing, how the systems work, what what behaviors, right? Because this is where it gets sticky. What behaviors we at some point go, hey, look, man, you can't do that around here. I I ain't saying you, you know, at some point we gotta say, hey yo, dog, you, you can't have open air drug market or counter counter uh, you know, something that might be benign. People are like, yeah, I wanna, you know, you can't fix mad cars in your lot. Or maybe you can, maybe that's the best way that we can actually create economy is that you can, yo, if you wanna put some food carts on your front lawn instead of having grass so that we have restaurants in the neighborhood. Like we, 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 we shy away. Cause, cause some of that stuff then gets into, you know, your municipal laws and property value and all these other things that are values in people's decision-making. And, you know, 
I would say I think a lot of people are are very. I, I think there's an academic concept of folks feeling like you don't need to tell black people what to do with themselves. And, that, and that's not what I'm saying to do. But I think sometimes when you start talking about organizing with people that folks feel like you're going to, you're going to go in there and tell these people what to do with themselves, as opposed to maybe, you know, my thing is you need to convene people and get talking and then let people make decisions because they become together and started talking. You don't need to get them together and say, no, I already have a plan. Do my plan. You get them together and say, look, you need to come together. And then y'all that are closest to the issue that, or the area, the physical space that you want to move or operate in a certain way, you need to learn everything about what things you can impact to make it operate the way you want it to operate. Well, right? but people so are scared say, of that because they feel like it may not end up with the right answer. This is my personal oh, yeah, perspective. That's... It's almost like that if you get a whole bunch of folks together to say, what's your solution to this problem? Some people will say something counterintuitive to what you think is the academic solution to what they should say. Mm. Right, and, right, right. and you take away their agency. You give them agency because of their pain, but you take away their agency when they don't respond to things in the way you think they should. Yeah. Right? And I think, def- quote unquote, defunding the police is a great example where you have populations, and it usually cuts across by age. There are populations mm-hmm. of people who are like, yo, these systems have been crooked. I learned about it in college. They'll forever be crooked. I read a book on it. Get rid of the police. It started from slave catchers, right? You got other folks who say, for a variety of reasons, our neighborhood has been besieged by forces, usually from outside, who then impacted the inside. And they want to be safe, however they define it. So they may want the resources to be redistributed. They may want different people being the police, but they may not not want the police. So if you organize the entire Black community and ask them what they want, you may end up with a complicated number of answers when from a perspective of people what they, they, we think people should say, you would also want them to always end up with the right answer. And I put that in parentheses, right. right? Like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But see, and this is for me, is where I get into freedom, right? Actual freedom is about you might make decisions that are bad, <laughs> <laughs> you, you your decisions will have outcomes and you have to like to me we we have to live on the real planet earth there's no guarantee of utopia of a utopic outcome of people having more control and agency and so if if the if the if the if the fear of getting people together to make plans is that they'll make the wrong plans so then let's not get them together to make plans understand that the other people who are getting together to make plans are making plans and you're living with the outcomes so either you 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 become active Right, you become an agent in your own outcomes, in your own world, or you become, you stay, or you you exist in a space where you're just, you know, you're reacting to whatever forces or pressures apply to you. And I, I think that, that I th- but I think we have to have a grappling, rolling conversation about that for this to be a longitudinal operational vision. Because you got to go, like, you know, I mean, look, if if let's say thirty percent of those who who had the means to do so, you know, maybe like um, if you own a home. Uh, you guys probably or whatever. You say I'm gonna sell all my my, my personal belongings. I'm I'm a I'm a I'm gonna I'm find a job down in this city. And you know, some people you know they might come with, depending on where they live, they might come with two three hundred thousand dollars in their hands if they had a home and you know, uh, shit, a great number of this place. Especially if they come from like L.A. If you was able to achieve you know multi home property ownership in L.A. If you sold they they sold their homes right now, they might have a million dollars in their hands. Talking about I'm moving back to Mississippi. I'm gonna buy I'm gonna buy something in a in Jackson. I'm gonna buy like a brown, I don't know, I don't know they got some kind of brownstone town home, Victorian. They got something. Right. But you know what I mean? I, and I'm gonna I'm I'm reestablish myself here, right? There's gonna be tension with people with different economic visions and expectations, people with different experiences of like. You know, yeah, like actually I've had a pretty, you know, despite the reality of maybe be operating with certain levels of, you know, fear and stigma and da 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 I've actually got a pretty good life. You know what I'm saying? My life isn't been all like pain and trauma, so to speak, on a day-to-day basis. And you might be, you might, you, your presence, like we, we, you still have to find a way to, to come together wherever you're going. Like you don't just, 
you just gonna move the cell and drop it and then you're like oh i'm just like black here now it's like no like they got expectations and you know some of us that are not um you not operate within traditional um you know christian and uh religion concepts and you're gonna go to a place where everybody expected to be at church right you know right. I mean? like no, you know, like this is real. This is real talk. We gotta like, go like, hey, listen, man, I ain't gonna like talk bad about y'all, but I ain't coming. Well, it, well and that's <laughs> like, where we have to define. Not to get too like the stuff we say, um, we talking about, but that's where blackness yeah. has to be defined differently than just proximity and share and mm-hmm. shared activities. Right. Um, right. While at the same time, it does have to be shared culture and shared interests, broadly speaking if not specifically mm-hmm. speaking. One of the things I wanted to share uh, the transition is, is the same thing about uh, uh, Chokwe Antar Lumumba and recently, and he developed this idea called the solidarity economy. Cause he said, what he found was when they started having these people's assemblies to like hear people, they would start mm-hmm. talking about self-determination and freedom and what does it mean to live outside of blankety blank. And he said that old black folks would say to him, sweetie, I love everything you're saying, but how are you going to fix that pothole? Mm -hmm. Right? Because that's the challenge I have today. Mm -hmm. Today's challenge is my hubcap fell off because of a pothole in the infrastructure of the city, which compromises my quality of life. So while you may be speaking to a broader intellectual concept of the quality of life how do you connect that with a real thing in real time right that speaks to hey i like being here because the roads are clear and the water is fresh and i can go get a job and see people look like me but the infrastructure is part of their experience it's not just like what's part of their experience is the idea of what we're talking about it's also the actual physical thing and that's where i think his this conversation will continue to be important because I'll argue people, young people will continue to vote with their feet, right? And the mm-hmm. issues that Absolutely. the issues, and I could use the Pittsburgh context, but say for sure, a lot of American, a lot of cities where black folks have been traditionally are losing intellectual capital to the South anyway. Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's happening in real time. It may not be happening in the sense where people are then going to these places and voting, which is a challenge, but they're just going and they're spending their money and they're living. They may not be yeah. part of the community organization, but like they're going to this place. And so it's already occurring. The question is, like anything, how are you going to take what's actually become an organic occurrence? and thrust it into a vector in a movement where you can actually benefit the collective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man. Well, we going pretty deep. And I don't, you know, <laughs> I don't think we needed to get to a, to a, to an answer to the question, so to speak. I mean, I think if we had one, if we listen for all y'all listening, if we had an answer to make us famous, if y'all want to answer, <laughs> come back next week. We'll tell you the answer. And then you can put us on to be like these fitness people or these relationship people where we just give y'all answers and shit, even if it don't really work in real time. So we can be like everybody yeah. else and get paid. That's right. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, yeah. We'll out here. Make one of them. Uh, <laughs> that's what I thought. I'm going to make a pamphlet. Make a pamphlet. Get my ebook. You know what I'm saying? Get my ebook. I'm going to tell you all the answers right there. That's right. You know what I'm saying? But, um, you know, because this is something I want to wrestle with. You know what I mean? Because, you know, I, I I think about, I think the willingness to move um, s- similar to, for me, is, is a part of my own, you know, I guess, arc of life. You know what I'm saying? I left New Jersey, go to Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh, go here. <laughs> and, like, and, and I'm open, you know what I mean, to, you know, to, you know, to, to other people's offers, depending on what they talk about. You know what I'm saying? Because I, cause I think that that is the thing that I know I can do is like I, I can leave, you know what I'm saying? I can or I can choose where I'm at, where I show up. And um, and that is a certain level of agency for me, which I know is not something that every, that works for everyone. Um and and I and I try to and I really want folks to with ideas like this and, and with any kind of it's not not feel like we gotta come to a decision just yet, but let's let the thought. <laughs> 
roll around. Let it let it let it let it marinate. You know what I'm saying? Let ideas wash over it. Let you know, let it rub over the mountain. Let, let, in the words of Dave Chappelle, let the dirt wash over you. And, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? and think about what could this what does this look like? What could the the thought here look like in practice? And then the other piece that I would encourage people um to do one is go buy the brother book, read it. <laughs> read the book. <laughs> like if you if you want to understand what he's saying, read the book. Like don't just listen to us talking about the book. Um, but further understand the that um decision making uh and thought around like what people should do is is a multidisciplinary, multi-level, a lot of different pieces of input and information um really um impacts because you know one of my big concerns, and this is where I'll leave because maybe you know say I, I want to come back to this at some point is like what is what is the role of our changing climate on choosing these locations as places to move to mm -hmm. <laughs> where you know there's other factors that might make these difficult places to live in the next hundred years you know what i'm saying but that's you know 100 years from now is a long time so i mean i could dig it um so that i mean you know did you have any other closing thought you want to add um uh, no i just think i think you said it like most things you said it really succinctly and well i just think that the the new challenge is to think about the common things we've been dealing with, but also to think about stuff in a new way and have a different conversation. Because yeah. sometimes, like you know, we all talk about, you you got to ask yourself a question, then you got to ask yourself, is that the right question? Right, right. And I just think, you know, when it comes to quality of life for Black folks in cities, generally, but I mean, we use cities here, particularly are we asking ourselves the right question? And so I think, you know, as we continue to build, we can get further into that. All right. All right. So with that, um, I'm going to say peace. Peace and blow us up like the mother people. Like y'all mother people, y'all like, they talk about <laughs> finance and relationships and shit and don't tell y'all shit they don't know about either. Blow us up like them right. so we can get paid. Right. Maybe we got to start having, start with a silly premise so people will look, listen and then we'll say something better. But, I, you know, you know, well, that's for another <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, I'm going to say peace. Thank you for listening to Good Brothers. Thank you to my good brother, I'm Majestic. Thank you to you, the listeners. Uh, we try to record uh, every week and, um, you know, keep this conversation and ongoing uh, dialogue going. And um, you know, Good Brothers is a part of the Ash Hole Head uh, family of podcasts and, you know, other things are in the works. Um, I appreciate you for taking time. If you want to support the podcast, one of the best the best things, first things you can do is share the podcast. Share with your friends, share with somebody who, you know, you think would uh, enjoy listening, you know, and adding on or being a part of our conversation. Uh, the next step you can do is, uh, you know, become a patron on Patreon. Uh, it's a couple different levels there, you know, and um, helps to offset what it costs, you know, to make this thing happen. Because it's like, in many parts of uh, our lives, I mean, don't run on good vibrations, even if it if 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 it, if it enjoys them, so to speak. Um, but in any event, um, please uh, check out Charles Blow, M Blow, Charles M Blow, the devil you know, and um, look, you know, stay tuned because I, I want to do some more with this uh, with this particular text, especially especially as I stated during this uh, dialogue with some younger people. Man, I really want to hear what their thoughts are about you know having that sort of vision about the future um and, and and people moving moving in more ways than one in terms of using their feet so as a, as is with all things please take the best part for yourself please be safe and um thank you for listening peace <laughs>